Scott, since we're doing joy on Friday, we can do fear tonight. Like, let's just keep it real. <laughs> we don't want to. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, but thanks for helping us get our um, announcements going and mentioning that too, because I think, um, yeah, it'll be really nice to have this space here for another community event. Um, so yeah. And for folks who uh, weren't directly a part of our Day of the Dead event, some were here. It was just such a, yeah, such an awesome event to come together as a community and um, offer something collective and then see what we received back. In the window is all of the written um, wishes for people's dearly beloveds. I, we guess, how many do we think came? Mace, like at least a thousand? Yeah. Yeah, but we had quite a lot of engagement. We created an altar and a mandala. Tig O'Malley, who many of you know, is a teacher here. Um, yeah, he put us all to work. <laughs> right, Walt? <well? laughs> making little stones, making the lines pop, and um, created a mandala and then a, a space for people to write. Um, anything they wanted to write for someone who's passed along. And we had a couple photos of family members and kitty fur beings, uh, family members, and just really wonderful to engage with the community just right down here in Petrero del Sol Park for Day of the Dead. And I think we'll definitely do it next year. That was just so awesome. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, we do like the slow, we can wait another minute. Okay. Yeah. Can we figure out? Keep the surprise alive. I think we probably should let folks know who's going to be teaching every week, right? That probably would make sense. Yeah. Because it, it hits me this week. <laughs> <laughs> online um but just welcoming folks and reminding folks that there are blankets and cushions um if you want to get comfortable for your sit you're also welcome to sit uh, if you prefer on a cushion on the carpet there tonight we're going to do a kind of series of meditation experiments so we'll be topping talking about a topic dropping in talking a little about a topic, dropping in. So we will be kind of like going between um, sitting and reflecting and discussing, um, just so you know. But yeah, it is, I think it's, I think the temperature is good in here, Mace, but if folks want blankets, um, it certainly is chilly. I think it's great. Yeah, we don't want that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you hear me online? Am I am I loud enough? No. Please talk into the mic because it's that's the Please. only one we have. Let's talk in the mic. Hi everybody. I'm Mace. I'm a volunteer here. I'm delighted to be here tonight with all of you. Um, so grateful that everybody's here. And I just want to give a couple announcements. Um, all of you, almost all of you um, look familiar, and you know that we are a volunteer run center. And so one of the most delightful things is to volunteer with folks and it's a great way to feel part of the Sangha. So we have, I'll look for the volunteer sign up on the desk and folks online, if you wanna just drop an email to the Dharma Collective, if you're interested. And then we have a couple wonderful events coming up this week. And the first one is this, um, we are doing a screening of Mission Joy, which is a wonderful documentary about a conversation between the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu about joy. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we are going to be in the center and zooming it, correct? Uh -huh. Yeah. So it would just be really delightful if folks wanted to come. Um, we're really ex excited. There's a little, if anybody wants to pass, there's like a little text photo thingy I can text you. What do you call that? No, the little oh, announcement. Yeah, a little text image of it but also what would be really amazing is these for these is not for those of you online 
But for those of you in here, if you're going to cruise around the city at all and you go to like a, a, your favorite cafe or restaurant or bookstore or other place where flyers go up, it'd be great to put these up because it would be nice to have a lot of folks here. So these are going to be at the front desk. And there'll be popcorn and tea. Of course, we have tea always at every SF Dharma Collective event. And then the other thing that's happening, just to let people know, and I just closed my phone, is some amazing thing on Sunday. Deborah Eden Toll. Thank you. Deborah Eden Toll. Turning, like, turning towards the darkness. Like from 10 to 1. 10 yeah. To 10 to 12. So if people want to explore uh, the, the, the turning towards the darkness as part of the path, that would be great. And then the other thing is that we do also have two other flyers for the cafe, uh, bookstore, billboard types in the group. <laughs> Um, that are just talking about the Dharma Collective. Mm -hmm. So the, all, all these will be up at the front desk with me. Um, and then finally, um, we do run the center on people's generosity and donations. And we also like to help support our teachers in these just insanely critical times mm -hmm. where the Dharma is so needed. I have no idea what happened for all of you, but I did not sleep last night. And I said to myself, meditate 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 and my anxiety was like oh hell no i'm just going to keep this system messed up and torture you and so like i really need to be here um so i think i'm probably not alone um and it would just be wonderful to have uh this center continue and we also understand that people are in very different financial places right like people can give a dollar and that might be something great people might not even be able to give a dollar and some people might be able to give a hundred dollars and that might feel right to them so you give what's right for you um on wednesday nights when you do the venmo or the paypal it's really helpful if you say if it was ever chandra because that's a way that the center does accounting for both of them to get paid but um anything you can give is really uh hugely um appreciated by the collective and all of the folks that are sitting here because it helps us stay open in this ridiculous city. Thank you. Thank you, Mace, and welcome everyone. Yeah, just a huge appreciation for showing up here in person and online to engage in these practices together. It's one thing to read a book, it's one thing to practice on our own, but um, I hope you will feel and experience tonight that when we come together to practice and to apply the teachings to our life, there's, there's more than the sum of parts. Something can really come alive for us. And there might be an insight that either I share or someone in the room shares that, that lands. And maybe it's the same teaching you've heard over and over. We are going to cover the same stuff, compassion, fear, the path. And yet sometimes we hear it in a way and it unlocks something for us that carries forward. And that's my hope. And uh, that's what I find in coming here. And I always love to bring, especially to our nights together, uh, what I feel is really alive for me on my path and in um, the practices that I am leaning on when things are challenging or hard. Um, before we get into practice and the theme for tonight, I just want to mention that the documentary on Friday night, Mission Joy, um, it's not only about joy, which both um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and His Holiness the Dalai Lama really embody, but how joy and sorrow can live together. Both of them face so much adversity in political oppression, exile, and both of them use their spiritual path for this incredibly transformative joy. And not just silliness, right, but like a joy almost as a radical act amid the challenges and difficulty. And um, some folks know I, I'm super fortunate to have just gotten back from Dharamsala and some time with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and to see the impact that he makes on the Tibetan people just as a man of joy and a man of peace and embodying that compassionate aspect. It's really moving. You know, just really uh, re-inspiring what can happen if we adhere ourselves to the practice. I can't promise we're going to be like the Dalai Lama, but I can um, I can affirm that a lot of the practices that he does every day are compassion practices. A lot of the texts that he's often referencing are texts that we use here. So it just gives me a lot of encouragement coming from that um, 
experience. And for the documentary, it will be a fundraiser. And the fundraiser is for the education of women who choose to be nuns and monastics in Tibet and Nepal. So there's some really incredible centers set up by a teacher named Sokni Rinpoche. And I got to visit one in Kathmandu before I came home. And it is such a quality um, kind of opportunity for these women to get the very highest level teachings in Tibetan Buddhism. Maybe needless to say, that hasn't always been available. Um, unfortunately, where there's a lot of focus on the monastics who are men, there hasn't been as much focus on the training for these women, many of whom go into three-year retreat, which is pretty standard to start then teaching in the world. And when I spoke with the director of the center, I encouraged them to send teachers to us so we could host them here, which would be wonderful. And so, yeah, just an extra incentive to come and, and support that work. But um, yeah, I'll share a bit more about that on Friday night. So I'm Eve Ekman. I am half of the Well of Being teaching team. I get to co-lead this night with Chandra Easton. And for those of you who are coming for the first time, welcome. We're so happy to have you. And for those of you who come frequently or often, welcome. So happy to have you. We are going to kind of continue our work with meditations that bring forth healing. That's been the theme of the book we've been working with. And the theme tonight especially is bringing compassion to our fears. It's been a topic um, that I've been personally working with, I, maybe for different reasons, Mace, but have found myself kind of doom scrolling in my own mind in the middle of the night. Anybody know that feeling? And you're like, what's, what else? Oh, wait, let's keep going. There's climate, there's politics, there's my relationship, there's my work. Oh yeah, what about my friend, my brother? Like just, and though I do think applying our meditation in the night can be really helpful and we can do our best and try, we actually really need to work on it during the day. And we have a bit more clarity and a bit more capacity so that when and if it comes up for us in the night, we kind of already have been establishing the ground of a sense of care for ourselves, stabilizing and calming the mind. Um, and so tonight I thought we would explore a bit of kind of what it is to know fear, what it is to feel fear, and then what it is to heal our fear. I think that those phases are all really important. You'll see many Dharma teachings in which we kind of find our way to each one of those aspects and i'd like us to you know really explore each and meditate on each together um, so for our first practice just to get us settled i'll invite us into our bodies and invite us into our breath and then we'll move a bit into this investigation of what is it that we are afraid of using our thinking mind to really apply ourselves to that We'll move from there into this feeling. So engaging with the subtle body. Because our fear, of course, it is super potentiated by our thoughts. But it's felt in the body. And to really be able to feel and know the imprint of fear in the body is an important step for us to embrace, maybe even love, that experience of fear. And for the healing, maybe no surprise, it's going to bring compassion to our fear. And I thought it was really interesting to investigate what's in the way, right? Why not have compassion for our fear? It seems so natural, but I don't know if you all experience this. It's not always that easy. I mean, a lot of ways we kind of just can't quite touch it or like avoid it or maybe don't think we deserve it. So we'll look a little bit about that process of engaging with our compassion to really meet our fear and open up with it. So without Further ado, let's give ourselves the wonderful opportunity to drop into practice, just kind of simple settling in practice. So finding a posture that supports these essential qualities of relaxation and ease, as well as uprightness and vividness. We can check in and see whether our sense of balance can be experienced through the spine. Feeling this pliancy of the spine balanced between being a little too far forward and caught in our thoughts 
or leaning a little too far back, falling into dullness, finding a real nice upright posture for the spine. Inviting ease and relaxation through the belly. And that same ease and relaxation through the hands. You can even stretch them out and pull them into fists and stretch them out and pull them into fists and help them find a place of rest. Either laying flatly in the lap or folded. And feel and imagine a slight upward tilt of the chest and a shining the heart upwards towards the sky. And softening and softening and softening through the face. Relaxing, especially around the eyes. Begin by bringing your attention and awareness fully into the space of the body. As you breathe in, feel a sense of the whole body breathing in. And as you breathe out, feel a sense of the whole body breathing out. Invite your entire center of gravity to descend. Not energizing thoughts in the mind, but really feeling the stability and rootedness in the belly and the buttocks. Feeling this breathing body with its qualities like a mountain, centered, stable. And to help settle the inner speech and thoughts, bring your attention even closer now, noticing the rise and the fall of the belly.
each time you become distracted as an opportunity to develop your awareness. Just relax and release whatever captures your attention and return. Bringing your full attention and awareness to the belly. So it gently rises through the inhale and falls through the exhale. This simple but not easy practice, following the breath. It truly is the keys to the kingdom, training our attention, gaining insight into where our mind goes and how to redirect it back. Let's refresh our interest for just a bit more time here with the gentle curiosity of what each new breath may bring. And to further our practice, we'll apply introspection, a noticing of our own mind. Notice whether the mind feels dull and lethargic, maybe a bit sleepy, or maybe busy, active. For experiencing the dullness, we can focus on the inhale, inviting in vividness and clarity. If we have that energetic or speedy monkey mind, just relaxing through the exhale. For a couple moments, applying this antidote, continuing to refine our attention on the breath.
And we'll shift slightly to not just focusing on making the body and mind serviceable, but having a sense of this place and this space, feeling and recognizing our body connected to the earth below us, to the nearly full moon above us, connected to the community gathered here tonight. Connected and situated in this moment, we can extend and expand our mind to the history of the places that we are all sitting in in this moment, considering hundreds and thousands of years of other inhabitants here. those who protected and guarded these lands, those who struggled here, those who flourished here. And continue to imagine into the future, hundreds of thousands of years, all the beings yet to come. Feeling a sense of our own place in their history yet to be. And from this broad view of what came before and what comes ahead, Consider your intention for being here tonight. The intention can reflect a sense of what matters to you, what you value. What you'd like to cultivate in yourself and offer to others. Lean back in your mind and heart and body and allow the intention to come to you. And whatever word or phrase or image has come to mind, let's hold it for a moment. Feel it as a guiding light. And then imagine the intention being resaturated into the mind and heart and body and returning to this focus on our breath and the body, breathing in, feeling the whole body breathing in and breathing out, feeling the whole body breathing out.
Thank you for your practice. Welcome again. Any questions or reflections? You know, it's a so-called simple practice, but I think mindfulness of breathing is one of the most advanced practices that there is. It's quite challenging. Um, and it can bring up a lot for us in terms of gripping, in terms of where the mind goes. So yeah, any questions or reflections from folks on our settling in practice? Any intentions that want to be shared? Yeah. 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 Thank you. So Karen shared that um, having that process of settling or Alan Wallace uses this term, which I love, making the mind serviceable <laughs> by settling the body, speech, and mind in their natural states. And then the intention can maybe be a little bit less cognitive, right? It can kind of come to you or feel like it's in the body. And I don't know about you all, but sometimes I can kind of like race through my intention setting. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Peace of mind, peace for all beings, blah, blah, blah. Moving on. And to just like let it um, come is so nice. And, you know, not to get too metaphysical, but hey, there's a full moon and everything. Um, can we feel the intentions of others in the room? I think there's like a sense of it. It's really interesting when everybody is setting an intention at the same time. It's almost like something shifts a little imperceptibly. But um, yeah, thanks. Anybody else? Something they want to ask or share? Yes. Hi, Kelly. Um, I wanted to share the what is your counterpart name? Chandra. Chandra. So she, you were in India. Yeah. She did it on and um, that's it. And um, one of the things I heard her say was um, she was seated at a plane that was not on. So she goes, I think you could feel that my body might be in. Beautiful. Yeah. So Kelly shared with us that um, Chandra uh, offered this, this beautiful line for how we bring mindfulness to our body, which is breathing in, tending to the field of my body, breathing out, tending to the field of my body. And I love that you say, uh, I think it's a healthy attachment, um, you know, that it, you know, it's working. Like, I think if we get any of those like handholds with our practice, like just go, you know, for me, you know, experiencing myself as a body of light has just been a refuge for years. I can just kind of go there. And it was, you know, also for my teacher and just really, um, yeah, really works. So whenever we find those turns of phrase that can really work for ourselves, it's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. So I, I that. Yeah. Um, but I was also <clears> the <throat> mm. Oh, nice. Yeah. And um, when I was with you or people like that, I think you get more Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And um, Kelly's sharing that um, in a sangha in Hawaii, there were fewer people and it was a little bit easier to be present. And for folks online, we only have one mic tonight. So this is what we got. Um, so I will do my best to transmit the knowledge from the room. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I think <laughs> it's interesting because um, as humans, we have this incredible potential to emotionally regulate one another right? Like we can come together and 
you know, I, I don't know, earlier today I was having a, um, feeling a little stressed out and then I, um, got to be with some dear friends and my mood shifted, right? Like we can be with others and they just regulate us and we can be with others and they dysregulate us. And especially safety and a sense of safety is so important for us to really drop in to the body. And um, thank you for bringing it up because I, I usually start um, our time here together by really emphasizing how that is a value for us here in the Dharma Collective. We want to create the opportunity for people to feel space, to feel safe. We can't ensure it, but it is something that um, all of us who get to be teachers here and volunteers here really matters. And some of our practice and being together, when we share and when we listen, we can kind of engage in the co-creation of safety by having a sense of really compassionate listening and compassionate speech. Because it's something all of us want. So why don't we all feel safe all the time, right? Like, just like we all want to be happy. So why aren't we all happy all the time? If that's what we're all trying to do for each other, why do we? And it's just, you know, pretty much as simple as our needs and wants, though universal, manifest in these very unique ways. And so how do we kind of go underneath and start to examine our own um, experience of what is it like to really hold in compassion what someone is saying and hold ourselves in compassion as we're speaking. That brings us to that universal, that sense of, oh yeah, I want to be free from suffering and so do they. And when we get more and more close to that, the more we can create that space of safety because we are in this together. When I got to spend time with His Holiness the Dalai Lama a couple of weeks ago, he probably said at least 300 times in our um, couple of days of meetings, we are all brothers and sisters, 7 billion of us. We all want to be happy. We all want to avoid suffering. It is far too late for us to be fighting. It's far too late. I'm talking about the climate catastrophe. It is time, truly time, for us to come together and be kind. It's beautiful. So yeah, thank you for that reflection. So now we'll move on to fear. Who's excited? Yes. So fear is maybe needless to say, it's a universal emotion, meaning there's actually a kind of a unique facial signal. It's a unique vocal tone with fear. Um, and there's a, a theme of fear that's universal. Fear is uh, a sense of threat obviously, and a sense that we might be in harm's way. Fear has a really broad range. Fear is like, you know, it's just like an incredible, um, I'm gonna say like tapestry or bouquet, like there's so many different forms. Uh, we can think of one, for example, like my, a top hit in my world, anxiety. Any other forms of fear that folks can think of? Worry, terror, <laughs> aggression's anger. Yeah. Fight or flight. Yeah. And with fear, fight or flight is, is our response, very, or freeze, right? They're our very common responses for us. With fear, we can also feel panic. We can feel a sense of um, actually, you know, feeling shy right, is a way of feeling fear. It's just like this huge range of this emotion. And in many different schools of psychology, they have different views of, you know, the kind of the role and also the primacy of fear. Um, some schools of psychology really believe that fear is the quintessential emotion. Every emotion comes from that. I don't quite agree. And yet I understand why one would think that. When we catch on to our fear and our sense maybe of underlying anxiety, it's so difficult actually to really notice its prevalence. It can, for many of us, be like the water that we're swimming in, right? This, this kind of low level worry, like, am I gonna, like I drove tonight, I usually don't drive, as most folks know, I ride my bike and I was like, am I gonna make it on time? Is there gonna be parking? Like low level fears, right? And then I'm like here, I'm like, okay, Am I sitting in the right position? Like, what's going to, you know, when's May's going to do the announcements? Like, we can just be running these kind of fear-based um, thoughts 
so commonly and so often. And I think it's really useful to start looking and like peeling back the layers beneath our fear thinking. So I was mentioning earlier my, my nighttime um, doom scrolling of my own mind, which is a great place to investigate fear because it's, it's all these different topics that come up. But then I start to try to just go down one layer deeper, one layer deeper, like what is it I'm really afraid of? Of, of course, survival, right? Fear is considered to be part of our, you know, rep, so-called reptilian brain. Um, I think that doesn't do a service to reptiles, but it's this very like quick, fast, easy way for us to ensure survival. We can feel fear before we think, moving ourselves out of the way of harm, right? Like if a car is coming quickly, we're not like, huh, we feel fear and we move. And the same is true, not only for our physical well-being and survival, but for our social well-being and survival. So we feel a sense of fear or anxiety or worry to be included in the tribe. If we're not included in the tribe, it's literally a threat to our well-being. The thousands of years of history when, you know, we all did live, um, our ancestors lived in conditions where if for some reason or another you became... Um, exiled from the tribe, you would not survive. And we have a kind of fantasy of independence that we live in these days. Like I can buy my own tortillas and, you know, take care of myself, but like, I need y'all and, and we need each other. But there's a little bit more space from that. And yet, I think for many of us, we can still feel that sense of not only do I desire and want to be loved, like I need to be loved to be safe and to be okay. And I, I won't speak for you all, but I think for many of us, that's really beneath a lot of our fears. Am I loved? Am I okay? Will I be safe? And one thing I think is really um, kind of tender to think about is all of the extra layers we put on top of that. You know, all the other fears that come on top of that. And there's not, um, there's not a, uh, I was just going to say, it's not totally dysfunctional for us to have fear. Like, fear can be very helpful. All of our emotions have a wonderful purpose and can really serve us. And the fear can really motivate us, right? Like, oh, I, you know, I feel anxious about if I'm doing enough, so I'm going to apply myself and maybe I'll take this class at City College next semester. I'm just not feeling inspired, you know, and this so a little bit of anxiety, am I doing enough? Am I fulfilling my life purpose? Might motivate us to expand, to be creative, to try something new. So we don't need to get rid of fear. But I think a lot of the ways that many of us experience fear, it feels like something we don't want. Like, is anyone in this room like, I'm down, like fear, come hang out. Like, I can't wait to get some more fear. Right, I mean, like horror movies, maybe. Like some people choose that. Um, but generally, like, we don't want more fear-based thinking. And yet, um, it is very common and very prevalent. And again, part of that has to do with our evolutionary history, our conditioning, our contemporary culture. And our fear isn't delusional. There's a, there's a lot of good things to be worried about, right? Lots. Yes. Sorry. Rewind. Yeah, yeah. Good, please. Um, bring me more fear, give me more fear, depending by what. And I think that does come into play with um, uh, remorse or maybe mm. more than remorse, guilt. Yeah. You know, um, I'm fearful because I've done something that I find inexcusable. Yeah. Terrible. And that, you know, something bad is going to happen to me. Yeah. I'm not going to be loved. I don't deserve to be loved. Yeah. And I deserve it. So, mm. so in a way, I yeah. think that's, that's kind of like asking for yeah. fear. Yeah. Um, I'll try to, to, to rephrase that. So Walt was sharing that something that came up was thinking about how, especially when it's tied with guilt, you know, like I did something wrong, I am wrong, or shame would be I am wrong, but I did something wrong. And, 
God, I'm afraid of the consequences, but whatever the consequences are, I probably deserve them. And so this kind of like, um, it's almost like we don't want to let go of our fear. And, you know, guilt is an interesting one because guilt is this sense of, yeah, having, having done something wrong. And often guilt can help us with repair, motivate us to be like, I'm going to make this right. But it can also fall into that spiral with fear of like, oh, man, no way I can make this right. Someone's going to find out this is going to be bad. And it is so interesting to admit that like a lot of us, like we like our fear. We actually kind of like dig into it, right? And even if we don't consciously think like, this is pleasant, I want it. It feels safe. Like if it's nothing to be worried about, like I am worried, right Mace? Yes, <laughs> we, we share that. Um, so this like sense of like what fear does to us. So fear, unlike let's say sadness, it's energizing, right? There's like <sighs> sadness, like, oh God. So much interesting interrelationship with fear and sadness, right? Like it can go both ways. Our sense of sorrow and loss can make us feel afraid, right? Like, you know, if we lose someone or something precious to us, we might worry that we'll lose everything precious to us. And then also, you know, we can reach a state of fear where we just have a sense of overwhelm. Or we can really succumb to hopelessness and despair. This is why you see, like clinically speaking, anxiety disorders and depression are just like yin and yanging, right? Um, not trying to endorse um, identifying with disorders, but that we see these symptoms that we are experiencing of fear and anxiety and hopelessness and despair. They really come together. So for this uh, really exciting and, of course, uh, uplifting talk on fear. What I would really like for us to do in this phase is to get a sense to know our fear. What is the fear? Maybe there's many, but I'm inviting you to look at like, is there something that feels more core? Something that kind of is that, that worry of either, again, like I suggested, I'm, maybe I'm not lovable. Maybe I won't be loved. Maybe I'll be alone. So I'm going to ask us um, to take just a couple moments with eyes closed if it feels comfortable, but to apply our thinking mind. So we're not going to the body here. That'll be next. And we can use this a bit as an inquiry practice. Even bringing up the word fear, worry, rumination, anxiety can start to help us identify and work with a sense of that. And we want to touch it lightly here. Again, that sense of almost leaning back of like, what is the fear? It's okay if there are many thoughts or few. I'm going to just spend a moment or two longer here. And then to give yourself a little bit of a break before we work with the fear, you can put a hand on the belly and a hand on the heart. Give yourself a really nice exhale. Remembering that these fears, they're here to serve us. And then really gently wiggling fingers and toes and blinking our eyes open into the room.
Anyone willing to share what came up? Jimmy. <clears throat> I was, you know, I was like, okay, what am I afraid of? And I've been thinking about fear the last couple of days. Wow. And I hide from my fear a lot. And the last couple of days, I thought it was a fear. It's not a good idea to hide from fear. And I'm afraid of all kinds of things. I've been afraid of a lot of stuff. In the last six years, things got weird um, politically in this country, even more so than usual. But on a personal level, I'm afraid of being a bitter old man. Mm. And I'm already an old man. <laughs> so I'm not afraid of getting older. Mm. You know, I've never really been afraid of getting older. I've always liked the idea. Of getting older, mm. but um, I'm afraid of becoming bitter. Mm. I'm afraid that so much of life can be difficult, and I had I mean, it's really easy for me to get this to develop a sort of sense of resignation, mm -hmm. to sort of be resigned to the shit, mm. and mm. Uh, I'm afraid. Of that resignation, which can be a you know acceptance can is one thing. Resignation is a little bit further on the scale. Yeah. That resignation becomes bitterness. That yeah. The all the way. Yeah. You know. I don't. But then I'm afraid of it. Yeah. Then I then I won't. That, it won't be as much fun to be alive. I won't be this enthusiastic. Kind of, you know, have yeah. That I yeah. But, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Jimmy shared that there's a when he is giving himself the opportunity to really look at his fear, which he's been doing, that he there's a fear of being a bitter old man, and he claims he's an old man already, and not bitter, but the bitterness is kind of this. Um, you know, slide from resignation into just kind of that, yeah, that like uh, stew in a way of bitterness. And what I got a hit of when you're describing that is it's like, it's like a fear of giving up, you know, like, and I don't know about you all, but I have, I've tasted that, right? Of like, I'm done. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm over this. And that is a, that's a weary state, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Well, two things came up for me. One, I remember the workshop I went to where it was about shame. And you wrote down something that we were ashamed of on a piece of paper and then just kind of folded it and put it like a little ways in front of you and just sat with that mm. the thing that normally just yeah. walked away. And the truth is about the sense of um, there's something disgusting. Mm. It was about fear. Yeah. It's primal that you can think about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when you see some poor person eating out of a dumpster, mm -hmm. it's so congested and disgusting. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of a fear that that's who I could move into. But there's parts of me that I've, I've done things mm. that I feel completely ashamed of. Yeah. That's like a huge fear. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It's been happening within my family. It's been about trying to understand more about the relationship with the Holocaust hmm. and how it's been passed down to me and others. And just the sense that you know, maybe it's related to this political evolution of this country of religion. You know, there was a time when just basic things were just taken away from you. You're mm. not going to help. Mm. Sorry, you own this house. Mm. You think you live here? No, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, but there's a sense that just um, project I'm working on, but I think it's interesting to understand mm. what it means to have basic values. Yeah. And it's corrupted. Yeah. Maybe nothing to do. Yeah. It's, you know, paper, it's just a, 
Yeah. 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 And I appreciate you bringing the personal and the political, right? So the, the personal fear of, will someone find out that there's something horribly wrong with me, right? I'm so down with that one. Anybody else? I'm like, that one is like, it's so interesting. I think it, I really believe it's a, it's a universal, at least in a lot of our contemporary culture and time. I don't know if this has always been true, um, but it does seem to be something that there's a huge struggle with. And we see that um, laid out in the psychological literature. And then the fear also of what if things politically here get far worse and whatever the stable ground we think we have is, is taken away. And um, it's interesting because I think there's both of those fears have um, some basis in reality, but one thing um, Sokni Rinpoche often shares, and I'm sure I've shared it here many times of the fear that is both real and true or the fear that is real, but not true, right? And so that like people find something out about me that will make them not love me, very likely that is real, but not true, as in the feeling is real in our body, but it's not true now. Maybe it's a story, maybe it's an old idea. And yet the fear that this country could go horribly wrong is kind of real and true, right? Um, and it's it's an interesting level of like, how do we know that fear and work with that fear? And then how do we know that fear that's a little less based in our everyday reality? And I do think both of them need compassion, but they need compassion in, in different ways, which is interesting. So when I think, you know, when we think about that compassion of like truly just kind of holding ourselves with the care and really saying like, thank you, fear. Like, I love you, fear. Like, I'm here with you, fear. And then the the, the one where it's something that's important to our welfare, right, is considering the future of this country. It's not like I want to never think about that, but it's not that I need to always think about it and create that habit. It's This is what I love when we think about what makes an emotion constructive or destructive. It's not the feeling of it. It's how we respond to it. And if we create an ongoing story in a loop with it, it can become much more kind of toxic and difficult for us. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. For me, it's, uh, it's non-verbal. Mm, yeah. It's more visual. It's like this shadow that I live with. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Father Do. This horror movie about this mother and son that are terrorized by this thing. And I don't think you ever see it. It's just like this shadow. Wow. And yeah. Um, that's what it's like for me. It's like this darkness. Yeah. I feel sometimes. I mean, not all the time. Like sometimes when I'm going to sleep. Yeah. And um, there's nothing left to do or watch or, you know, it's just, and that's it. That's when I really sometimes struggle with yeah. that. And I've tried all different things. Like, I've tried literally saying hello to it. Mm -hmm. I've tried being with it. You know, I have certain, like, imagery that seems to be helpful. Yeah. And at the same time, it's... Um, yeah yeah thank you for sharing that I, I i that is not uncommon when i've kind of worked with fear and um invited folks to reflect on fear that it's a it's not verbal it's not an image there's not a person there's not a story it's it's a it's a felt sense right and you said there's almost a visual element like a dark or shadow um aspect to it and i i often i what I have noticed is sometimes I have that kind of what I would call like a, a feeling form or waveform of that fear arise. And then I'll populate it with the doom scroll text. So it, it almost, it's like before I'm like, oh, this, something's not right. What could it be? And then make a list around it. So I like that you said you've also tried to work with it, um, talking with it, uh, inviting it in, but that it's annoying. And you know, I do think that wisdom of the, you know, putting your head in the demon's mouth, right, to make it 
actually vanish from your dwelling, you know, is how do we just feel like no preference? Fear? Okay. No fear? Okay. So hard, you know, and, and that is what we see in the teachings of like, how do we work with again and again, these difficulties in our life that come up no matter what. And it is trying to have that, you know, that pure vision where the sound of the backfire of the car is as beautiful as the sound of the bell. It's a very high aspiration, but I like to keep it in mind because for me personally, I do think fear is a problem and I think it's my problem. And so I find myself being like, okay, this is a problem. I got to get rid of it or it should be different. And that sense of, you know, it's just as beautiful as when I have a sense of true clarity, vividness, lightness in my mind. So, yeah, doesn't really feel that way. Karen's like, no, <laughs> they are different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, sometimes it's like that, you know, in, in, in the traditions, it's like the ultimate and the relative, right? And we live in this relative world with our everyday difficulties and dramas, but we're always imagining and working towards this ultimate level in which we have that pure vision. And it doesn't mean we need to, you know, expect that we reach it, but even knowing it's there can be an inspiration, you know, that there is this idea or ideal of like how we can engage, but it's hard. And it is, it is annoying to have that. And, you know, part of it is like um, you were mentioning that, Many of us epigenetically have um, imprints of very real fear that's ancestral. And it may not be a sense of this person in this lifetime that I can recognize. It's something we're holding. And so we might not get a kind of cognitive hit, right? We're still in the knowing phase of what it is. And we don't actually need to know, right? So knowing can be helpful. It's a way of being able to identify yeah, it's this story or this thing, but just being able to have, you know, some sense that I experience fear. I don't know what it's from. I don't know where it's headed. Yeah. So how do you know, I really like what you said about like, well, what I heard you say is that maybe there is no problem. Like there's like, there's the difficult, there's the pain of living the bad, and then there's the pain of judging it. Like, yeah. There's the wrong with me, and, you know, I, this is, so I, that, I really appreciate that, but I think that's interesting. Yeah. And at the same time, how does one know where you sort of say, yes, this is as beautiful as if I didn't have this versus, like, I need strategies, but I yeah. make people more empowered yep. and safe. Yep. Beautiful question. So the the question is, or the reflection first is, what if we could consider fear as like not a problem? Like, what's that like, you know, just as an investigation or thought experiment? And then how do we know when we're getting a little bit like, a, you know, our spiritual bypass of, well, nothing's a problem. I'm already great. Um, that, that is what's called premature transcendence, right? Um, we haven't actually done the work. <laughs> We haven't done the work and we're just like, I'm fine as I am. And I think we we have to be doing both. We are like nonstop ongoing cultivating our clarity, our compassion. There's not an end to that, like never going to happen. And we're also learning to have in some ways like more resilience with the difficulties that are there. And we're doing both. So it's like, okay, like this is here. It's not really a problem. And I am hella working on my compassion. I am still trying to identify the sources of suffering and, you know, more clearly see them and not keep tripping up on the same things. So I think in tandem, but it is, it's, it's a really tough one. I think, especially in the middle of the night, but I was sharing with um, a friend the other day, I had a number of weeks in Burma um, on a meditation retreat years ago and much of it was really hard. It was like a very hard retreat, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of experiences going on. Um, and one morning in my practice, just this like, I was like, what if everything's already okay? And I almost burst out laughing so hard. I had to leave the teaching hall because I was like, oh my God, 
yeah, everything might actually already be okay. (laughs) It was so awesome. And in the middle of the night, that's my mantra. Everything's already okay. Everything's already okay. You know, and not like you don't need to work or fix anything, but as part of that, especially to soothe the activated fear. It's one thing like for us to be able to talk about and work with our fear while we can kind of have a little bit of that distance. I love the description of kind of almost writing a fear down and putting it and looking at it. When we are experiencing that sense of over arousal from our fear, we need to have like different skillful means for soothing, something that can just work in the moment, the strategies, you know, as well. So all of it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. How about online friends? You guys have any fears? You're, yeah, Sylvia, Gina, I see the <laughs> nodding. You're still muted. We hear you, we see you speaking, but you're you're still muted. Oh, you can't unmute. Can someone unmute them, please? Beloved host. Okay. Great. Now, oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Hello, you and everybody. Hello. Um, I was thinking how afraid were why I I was growing up being a child, and I couldn't. Every night I woke up my parents to come and see me because I was so afraid, so Mm -hmm. afraid. Like somebody was going in into my room, was going to kill me. And Mm -hmm. uh, things got, uh, whoever, my psychoanalyst, maybe, that that fear left, left me. And I, 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 I don't live with fear now at nights mm. or during the day. Why that did happen? It was like I was hundred percent sure that somebody was coming in into my room mm. and was going to kill me. I was going to kill my mother or my father or my brother, mm. and. Uh, that that made me scream and cry and poor poor mother and poor father really mm. oh yeah. they, they were good people they really you know it, <laughs> I, I would go because i have my two children and, and and one was crying a lot and i would go and tell him, shut up <laughs> mm-hmm. mm. and that never happened with me. My parents never told me, shut up, which I deserve that and more. So it's very strange, the fear. It's mm. so strange because it, it, it's embedded you know, in some of us, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't have more to say and Gina is telling yeah. me, okay, okay, that's enough. And but you still have some fears now. They're just a different, maybe not as strong. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really impactful experience um, to have as a child too, because it's really we're so we can feel so defenseless. We can as adults too, but especially as children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's hard to know, you know, hard to know why um, that can arise for us so strongly, especially in, in our young life. Um, it can also happen in our dreams, of course, in a way that we feel so defenseless and um, difficult. Thank you. So now that we've, I hope, kind of like circled around fears, anyone feel a little anxious just talking about fear so much? Perfect. So we're going to do a practice, a really a simple short one on, on knowing fear. Sorry feeling fear. So the knowing is kind of this talking about it, investigating. And the feeling is this real sense of it's not just a thought. 
right? It's an embodied imprint. And the more we can familiarize ourselves with the sense of fear in our body, the more opportunity we have to know how to target our compassion. Because if our compassion is just cognitive, like, oh, I feel compassion for my fear, it's not going to really like get into the cells, right? Get into the bones, get into the muscles where we are holding it. So a lot of us hold fear in the shoulders. Some of us hold it in the low back. Some of us clench it in the belly. There's imprint of fear in our physical body. And then there's imprint of fear in what's called the subtle body. Right? So the subtle body is, it's, it's this kind of porous layer of where our psychological material, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, you know, they're kind of moving through or getting blocked in the body. Talked about a lot in Tibetan Buddhism and of course in um, traditional Chinese medicine, we see a lot of these ways that the energy moving through our body um, can really reveal a lot about our our moods and our emotions. It's not just a headache, right? It's anger. It's not just a stomach ache, it's fear, right? And how do we start to notice the imprint? So we don't need to bring anything new to mind, but to just gently, again, kind of turn towards our own experience and do this first person investigation of the imprint of fear in the body and become so curious about what this talking about fear, or listening to fear, curious about this, the granular level of sensation we may be able to notice. Maybe there's a tightening in the jaw around the eyes. Tightening in the shoulders or through the chest. And not forcing anything that isn't there, but just being curious about the felt experience associated with talking about and reflecting on fear. And we let this curiosity be really kind. We're not going in trying to wrestle down the feelings of fear. We are tenderly inviting a closer look onto what might be held in the body. We may notice that the sensations shift and change. The experience of our emotion and the body is changing. Comes and goes, maybe becomes stronger and then softer. And feel a sense of the kindness and care that wants to be and meet with fear. Invite some softening through the exhales. And some gentleness around the sensations in the body that may be tight or heavy. There's not specific areas where you feel fear. You can just feel that this body is a body that can be one of fear of contraction and tightness. And just invite that same sense of care, <clears throat> gentleness, loosening, as though the fear could unwind itself, breath by breath.
This body that can be a body of fear is the same body that is a body of compassion. Again, without a lot of thoughts, just feeling into the body, cell by cell, particle by particle, infusing a sense of care right alongside the fear. The very nature and story of fear is a story of compassion. Our desire to be safe, to be well. Continue to invite this co-mingling of compassion and fear. Softening and relaxing in the body. Any questions or reflections, especially from folks we haven't heard their voice in the room yet? Could you feel the fear in the body? Where, where was it? Chest, belly, and the head? Yeah. Shoulders. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Yeah. 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 Was it open to the compassion? Good. 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 Um, so a description of the chest and the fluttering of the heart um, and a desire to kind of move around in the body, but a recognition that being still with it, more can be learned. And um, yeah, and the compassion was happily coming forth. Yeah, this is, uh, again, I'm very lucky this this teaching of Sokni Rinpoche, he was also in Dharamsala at this event with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And he said something kind of offhand, but we we're talking about the nature of selfishness and why humans are selfish. And he said, underneath selfishness is compassion. 
desire to, you know, be okay and protect those you love. And I had that like, I was like, everything is compassion. And beneath our fear is compassion, right? A desire for us to be safe and well, just a really um, another way to look at that experience. Yeah. Oh, no, behind you. Yeah. So awesome. Um, I will try to capture that, but, you know, a description of the really strong somatic experience of fear, which um, is not uncommon. And though it can feel like a burden is actually a big benefit because it is like our early alert system of what's going on. And when we have the somatic material to work with, we can, just as you said, relax into it without like energizing it. Like, no, I shouldn't be afraid. Everything's actually going to be okay. It's like cut the dialogue, just go to the, like being able to um, tune into the body and have that, like, I like what you said, the kind of in between, like, not like directly looking at it, but I'm not turning away. I'm like being with it or holding it. And, um, and that, you know, kind of naturally, you know, you heard a little bit of the compassion, but then turned towards your own practice and felt like, wow, all of us, right? All of us, and in your case, like these people in your life, live with this fear. It's, and again, it's just, it's just so tenderizing and humanizing um, to really have that empathy. And I think if we don't have it for ourselves, it can be very hard to have it for others. And one of the things I was going to mention about, you know, what's an obstacle of compassion for our fear? And they're very similar to our obstacles um, of having compassion um, and empathy for others. So one main obstacle that we see, I'll do this quickly. One main obstacle that we see for our compassion is um, a sense of overwhelm, right? Like, I can't. It's too much, it's too big. And whether that's us or someone else in our life who's suffering, like too much, can't do it. And we get caught up in almost this like self-related concern, like I can't do this, this is too much for me, right? And that's a way that um, we can like, I can't even apply compassion to it because I just, I can't, like, I can't. There's another part um, that we see also with a kind of a block to empathy and compassion is, a sense of like aversion and blame. I don't even deserve it. Like, why would I get compassion? Like, and the same thing, like, I'm not gonna give that person compassion. They definitely don't deserve it, right? There's a parallel. And especially if we don't like believe our fear is real, like I shouldn't be worried about that. It's like, yeah, but you are. And wishing you weren't 
then feeling aversion towards it is not going to get you any closer to working with that fear. You know, and that one I think is really tricky. Self-criticism, you know, is um, it's like everyone these days talks about the loneliness epidemic and I am so glad we're talking about it and we should probably talk about the self-criticism epidemic, right? Of just being hard, negative self-thoughts and just not being able to honor where we are. If we are feeling fear about something that's unreasonable, we're still able to attend to it compassionately. So that can be another obstacle. Um, and then the and then the last one is not seeing it. Like how can we apply c- compassion to what we are not aware of? And so I think that's why that process of you know either being able to somatically experience it or think about it, like what is going on? Like what is this fear? Where is it coming from? What is its real story? Um, so it could be that one of these pathways is, is really powerful for us, that knowing, then coming into the body and applying compassion. It could also be that we can just directly go to the feeling in the body, especially if there's not a story around it, and apply the compassion to it. I think it's really tough to not feel like it's something we need to get rid of that should go away. Um, and yet, Fear is a natural part of our physiology and psychology without which we would not survive. We need it. It's very useful. We have to engage in right relationship with that fear. And it's, I I just love um, thinking about fear specifically, because for most of us, like if you have anger issues, like people know about it, you're trying to get feedback, like you get feedback, like you're trying to work on it. But a lot of us can hide our fear. No one knows how anxious or fearful we are. And we're just like, no, it's good. It's just that thing that I do. Like, it's all good. It's actually not, you know, like it sucks up a lot of our bandwidth. And when we sit down to practice, like we are going to find what we are not dealing with. I think another part of it is, you know, because the fear can be so insidious and may not even be aware of it, we might, we might be actually like, kind of furthering it or retracing it through some of our practice habits. And I think it's, yeah, it's just, it's a really interesting one to sit with, to like sit with our fear and to invite that compassion. And I I do, I do think it's important to not too quickly apply compassion, to really know it, to meet it. And if we apply compassion too quickly, we may end up again, kind of bypassing it and the natural wave of form of our emotion will rise and fall if we allow it. But it's that denying, that avoiding that can really kind of make it stuck. You feel more solid. Oh, yeah. Wow. Made it through all that tonight. Um, Yeah. Just really, really appreciate being with you all and being able to, um, you know, connect and share. And my hope is something that someone else shared here tonight was inspiring and meaningful and bringing together the the sense of Sangha. And for those who shared, I hope that was also an experience that allowed a deeper inquiry or understanding. So let's take a moment to dedicate the merit of our practice. So really coming back to that sense of compassion, that embodied sense of compassion. We could imagine it as this radiant light at the heart. And we could imagine applying this compassion so that all beings could have a sense of safety and connection that all beings would know that they were loved, that all beings could be free from delusion and craving, hostility. Bringing our hands in prayer at the heart, if that's comfortable, dedicating our time to that aspiration, that the work we do here can radiate out 
like the light of compassion at our heart. Thanks all. So I hope to see you Friday. I just remembered I'm teaching a two hour class with Tibet House New York online Saturday, if you're interested. I think the topic is compassion. Pretty fairly certain it's compassion, but we're gonna work with global compassion. So not personal, but global. Um, yeah, please join if you're interested. Hope to see you here Friday or another time soon. Thank you.